This is amazing. I'm so excited. Hi friends, I'm out in the garden today. I've got a few projects to do, one of which is installing this new hose link retractable hose reel to this post and tying it into our frost-free spigot. Currently our irrigation in our raised bed garden is turned off, so I've been watering everything by hand. And you know, traditional garden hoses are pretty much a pain <laughs> and a gardener's nemesis with how often they tangle and kink. So I'm really excited to get this set up. I wanted to walk you through the installation and how the retractable hose works. But first, I wanted to show you a sneak peek. My husband is over painting the fence around the raised bed garden, and I wanted to give you a sneak peek. All right, I hope you can hear me over his sprayer. But you can see he's got the pergola all stained, and we're starting on the fence. It's looking so good. I'm really excited. So he tried a couple different methods to paint. I think this method is working the fastest and this is a, just a paint spray gun. So it is the Home Right Finish Max Super. It's relatively inexpensive. We've used it for a lot of different projects. Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to show you the hose link retractable reel hose. If you haven't seen it before, it's awesome. This will be my first experience with one, but from what I've heard and seen, they're phenomenal and just game changers in the garden. So I've just opened it up and it walks you through whether you're installing it on brick or on wood and just goes through the whole setup process. So I just grabbed all my tools and I'm gonna go ahead and unbox everything and get started. And it says for tools, I have my drill, a 3 inch drill bit, and a 3 8 inch socket. And that's all I need. So I've got, gathered all that and I'm gonna get going. This is the mounting bracket and the hose reel will just sit right inside this hole. So we're gonna mount this to the wood and it comes with all the screws and supplies we need. So Hoselink recommends a minimum of 35 inches off the ground. So I'm gonna go ahead and measure where I want my bracket to be. So based on the height of the fence, this is gonna tie into our dog run fence and where the boards are gonna run. I know that I want the top of my bracket to be right here. So I'm gonna just align that with my marking and then make sure it's level. I'm just gonna mark oops, my four holes. And then I'm just gonna drill my holes about two inches deep, which is what is recommended. So I've got it all secured and tightened in, and this thing is solid, not going anywhere. So once you have your bracket installed, it is really easy. You just put the pole inside the mounting bracket, and that's it. So this is great because then in the winter, we can bring this in to the shed or the garage to keep it from freezing. So it's awesome. And I love how it rotates so it can fold and go either direction and we're not when not in use I can fold it up against the fence and it is really sturdy and while I'll say it's it's sturdy and heavy it's not heavy too heavy to be able to lift I think I read that it's around 30 pounds so the next step is to connect it to our water source and they give you everything you need to be able to do that you can get a longer extension if you have a longer source so we'll see if this works I hope that this is long enough <laughs> I didn't quite measure this. My husband put this post in the ground because it's gonna be the corner of the dog run. So I'm 
hoping it's long enough to make it to our water source. Okay, time to turn it on, see how it works. So my hose, my connecting hose here, it fits. It is pulled a little tight, so I might order the longer, I think it's a six and a half foot connecting hose. So I might order that just to do that. All right, let's see it in action. Nice, it's a nice gentle spray. So I didn't end up attaching my dram wand to the end. I'm just partial to my dram wand, just from years of using them. The spray nozzle they included is definitely very nice and high quality. So to use it, just pull it to your desired length. Let go, release that tension, and it'll just lock in place. And then when you're ready to retract it back up, just give it a little bit of a sharper pull. Walk it back in, easy as that. All right, let's try it out on the cilantro here. I have some herbs that I direct sowed over here a few days ago. Just gonna water those. And I have some little baby radishes coming up over here. Next up on my to-do list for today is I'd like to get this patio peach potted up into a container. We, we actually purchased this last season. I just never got a chance to pot it up. It is a bonfire patio peach, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a very dwarf peach. You can plant it in ground, but they do great in containers. It only gets like five to six feet tall. Hardy to zones five through eight, and it produces kind of a firmer peach that is not good for fresh eating, great for pies, cobblers, that sort of thing, but it's really ornamental. The blooms I'll show you up close are just this really pretty pink white blend. And then the foliage is a very long elongated peach leaf that is burgundy red. They're just gorgeous. They do fruit and it is edible. It's just not the best for fresh eating. And because it is so dwarf, like it's not gonna get you the, the big yield that a huge peach tree would give you. Gosh, the wind today is so bad. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. Anyway, so I wanna get this potted up into this terracotta container. So I'll take you along while I do that and walk you through the steps. Really, there's not much to it other than putting in some fresh potting soil. I'm gonna add some biotone starter fertilizer and that's pretty much it. So first off, I've got my terracotta pot. Got my biotin starter fertilizer. I definitely recommend a starter starter fertilizer. I love this one because it does have slow release nutrients in it, fertilizer, but it also has mycorrhizae and all the microbes that help your soil, help the roots take up all those nutrients and get it going on the right on the right start. So then I've got my potting soil. I'll probably need to go grab another bag now that I think about it. But all we're gonna do is repot it. We want to make sure that the soil level stays where it is. You don't want to plant it too high, too low, just keep in mind where the soil level currently is. And I imagine this is gonna be pretty root bound, so we might have to break up some of the roots because it has been in that container for quite a long time. So because this is in bud and blooming. I want to be a little bit more careful when I'm transplanting it, just so I'm not knocking any of that off. All right, let's take a look. Wow, it's really not as root bound as I was expecting, considering it lived in that container all last year. But like I said, the this is a patio peach, which is designed, I should say, um, intended to be in containers while it does great in ground. So you can do either one. 
So what I like to do is use my existing container to give me an idea of where the soil should be. So you can see this would be way too high. So I'm gonna remove some of the soil. My goodness. I know a cold front is supposed to come through. So I imagine that's what's bringing all this wind. Got my height just about right. And now I like to just backfill with soil all around here. And I am gonna need to go grab another bag of soil. Okay, now that I have most of my soil along the sides built up, I'm gonna slip this pot out. And I'm gonna add my Biotone starter fertilizer, just all to the bottom, all around the edges. Woo! Windy day. Should be able to just slip this right in. There we go. I'm gonna add a little more Biotone to the top. Now I just need to finish off the soil level all the way around. Keep in mind where that soil level was before to not go above or below that. Now I'm just gonna water it in to make sure we got all the air pockets out and just settle it in to its new home. So that's it, it's all potted up in this container. I will fertilize it between now and the end of summer monthly. That's kind of what I do for pretty much all of my shrubs perennials, trees, well, not my trees. My trees are lucky to get fertilized once a season, but for the most part, everything else in my garden gets fertilized on a monthly basis. I'll just use most likely just garden tone on this. The plan for this will be to live on the deck once our deck is built, but it's not currently built, built so I will just find a place for it in one of my flower beds until then. There's a little pollinator in there. Thank you, little friend. I just love these blooms. They are so pretty. I'll have to show you when it's in full bloom. I'll post it to my Instagram, Garden with Joanna. And then when it leaps out, because the foliage is just so, so pretty. So I think I have time for about one more garden chore before I have to head inside today. And I'm going to go work on this back part of our garden in our backyard that is right off one of the bedroom windows. It's also off our sunroom, which is our school room where we do homeschool during the day. So it's a very visible part, uh, very visible garden. It's just been neglected like most of our <laughs> landscaping. So I'll, I'll show you what I'm working with. I just need to do some perennial cutback and then there's just a lot of um, leaves and debris that has collected over winter that I'm gonna clean out, do some pruning, and I'll walk you through all of that. But first, let me show you the space. So right now it doesn't look like much. Our back deck is gonna be built here. So this bed will be in between the deck and the house. Eventually, we would love to have built the deck all the way to the house, but we have this egress, I think that's what it's called. It's a exit to one of our windows in our basement. And we do have a new cover for that that we need to put on that's clear, that will allow light to get down to that window. But right now it's completely blocked off. So not the prettiest thing to look at. So I eventually would like to cover that with some pretty planting. So right now I just have this little fountain. I have some tulips planted around them. These are Color Blend's Best Pink. They, that is the first one to bloom. And you can see there's a few more buds coming up. And then around it is Carex Feather Falls, which is just such a beautiful texture and that variegated, it's just so light, flows in the wind. It retains, you know, most of its leaves, even in the winter, it looks decent. Right now it's collected a lot of debris. And then back here behind that, this is a Proven Winners mock orange called, I think it's Illuminati Tower. And it's supposed to be a very compact, narrow mock orange. So it gets about, I think four to six feet tall, but it stays pretty narrow. So you can kind of see by its growth habit already that it's just growing much more vertically. And I love mock orange. I know it's not used very often anymore because it's such a 
a large shrub, but when it is in bloom, it is so fragrant, which is why I thought it'd be really nice to have it off of our future deck right here. Over here, I just have this Mr. Bowling Ball Arborvitae, which is just a cute little small growing Arborvitae. I have a little peony here, tons of weeds that I need to take care of. This is another mock orange, and this is a really pretty one. It's kind of a variegated leaf, and it's Proven Winners Illuminati Spark. I think that's what it's called. I'll have to, if that's not the name, I'll put it on the screen. But like I said, I love mock orange. It's just so fragrant. And then back here, I have three uh, Proven Winners Firelight hydrangeas, which are panicle hydrangeas, which I need to do a little bit of pruning on, but you can see they're already starting to bud up nicely. And if you're not familiar with the firelight hydrangea, they bloom with their white panicle blooms, and then they will turn like a really rich kind of pomegranate-y red in the late summer, early fall. And they're just really beautiful and bloom. They get about six to eight feet tall, but because they're a panicle hydrangea, you can come in and cut them back pretty far in late winter, early spring, and it not do any damage to the blooms. Down here, I just have some very itty bitty hellebores that I popped in the ground. And then we also have just a nectarine tree here that is about to burst out and bloom. So really, I just need to get in here and rake some leaves, pull some weeds, do a little pruning. We obviously need more new mulch. So I know this space isn't much to look at right now, but you have to remember when we purchased this property a little over a year ago, there was nothing. The only thing that was back here was a giant butterfly bush. It was one of those two-story butterfly bushes where it reached the roof line. So we pulled that out. And then they had landscape fabric all under here, under the mulch. And I spent last year pulling that, tediously pulling the landscape fabric out. And then I just threw in a few of these plants, the, like, like I said, the hydrangea, the nectarine tree, some mock orange, a couple other things. Now, right now it is getting sun, but the pretty much once afternoon rolls around in the summertime, this area is in full shade. So it's kind of a part sun morning sun situation. I know it's not much right now, not much to look at, but I have a vision and I have a vision for all of my garden beds. It's hard to translate that to you, uh, but just know, even though it's not much to look at right now, I have big plans to make it beautiful and I will make it beautiful. So for now, I'm just gonna clean it up and work with what I've got. So I'd like to walk you through the steps of pruning this panicle hydrangea, which is the firelight hydrangea. But before I do that, let's break out some of the leaves so we can see what we're actually working with. So your panicle hydrangeas are your hydrangeas that produce those big cone-like blooms. Some of the more popular names are limelight, limelight prime, little lime, bobo hydrangea, strawberry sundae. There's a few others. This is the firelight and these do great in very cold environments because they bloom on new wood. If you have really hard, harsh winters, it's not going to kill your buds like what happens with your big mop head macrophylla hydrangeas. General rule of thumb to create a stronger plant so you don't have the really weepy hydrangea blooms is you really want to encourage the stems that are already really thick, that's gonna be your, your main structure. Instead of cutting it all the way back, that's gonna to continue to create really thin, weak stems. So you really only wanna take it about one third the height down. That's about the maximum. And you can kind of size control it with that by doing that one third cut every year. But beyond that, you don't really wanna to cut too much more than that. So we wanna encourage like, for example, this stalk right here, it's nice and sturdy. It's nice and thick. It's got just a good shape to it, good architecture down here. We wanna encourage this one to stay and just get thicker over the years. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do my one third cutback. And then after I do that, I will go in and I am gonna remove all of these little thin spindly branches. These are 
really no good to us. They're just gonna create uh, a weaker plant. And you wanna keep anything that's about the size of a pencil and bigger. I will do my more detailed cut after I initially take the plant back by one third. So you can measure the plant and then divide that by three and you know approximately the height that you can cut it back to. I eyeball it. I am not precise if you have not learned that about me. But, so I'm gonna go ahead and take this back by about one third. So when you make your cuts, your final cuts, you wanna find where there's a bud, which you can kind of see this, the bud starting to swell, and you wanna cut right above that. Of course, always m remove any dead or diseased branches. And then I'm gonna just go in here and really kind of pick my main leader branches and those are the ones that I wanna keep and everything else I'm gonna kind of prune back. Anything like this one down here, which is totally crossing the plant, remove, that'll help with airflow so it doesn't get diseases. Remember, this is only for your panicle hydrangeas. You do not wanna trim your macrophyllas, which are those big mop head, pink or blue blooms like this because they typically bloom on old wood so you will be cutting off all of your flowers for that year. So you can see we are left with a much better shape. We got all of the little spindly twigs out and that way it can use its energy into growing these stems stronger and thicker over the years. And it just takes some time, takes some seasons, growing seasons to really get a shape that you love. I'm looking at it now and I see a crossing branch over there on the left that I'm gonna take out. But I mean, if you consider where we started with, you know, lots of little spindly growth, this will just create the flopping blooms that we don't want. And let, we're left with just a nice structure for this year's growth. So I'm gonna repeat this on my two other firelight hydrangeas down here. So like before, I'm gonna take my height down first and then I'm gonna come in and cut out all the thin spindly branches. If you just go slow and take your time, you will start to see more of the shape and the really nice sturdy stalks uh, take shape so that you can make more educated cuts. So I don't love the shape that this one is, but they grow so much in one season that I think it'll, it'll improve a lot this season. And really this is more about pruning to the shape that you desire. I do not believe that there is only one way to do things, especially when it's your garden, you do it how you want it to look. All right, I think I'm happy with that. On to the next one. See how this branch is crossing all of these. So it crosses everything here. So it's gonna rub on all of those and it's gonna open it up for potential disease or injury. So we're just gonna remove that even though it was a nice sturdy branch, it'll be better in the long run.
So I've got the hydrangeas all pruned up. As far as everything else in this bed, I don't want to do any more pruning really. The mock oranges all bloom on old wood, so I do not want to prune those because if I do, I will be forfeiting my blooms. So I'm going to leave the mock orange alone and I think pretty much everything else. I just am going to rake things out, clean up the leaf litter, pull some weeds. If I see any damaged or dead branches, I will cut those out. I ended up with a container full of leaves and I think it looks a lot better. I mean, there's hardly, <laughs> there's hardly anything to look at in the bed, but you know, at least it's not full of weeds and debris. And hellebores, I don't know if you know, are incredibly slow growing. So it will be <laughs> quite a long time before these hellebores have any size to them, but they all gotta start somewhere, right? And this is definitely the beginning. I told you guys it's going to be a long work in progress, but it is a blank slate and there's a lot I want to do in all the garden beds, but at least I got this area tidied up for now. I think this area looks a lot better now that the, you can really see the tulips and the carex around the fountain. All right, that's it for today's little garden chore day took care of uh, mounting the hose link, installing that, potting up this sweet little peach tree and cleaning out just one little section of my garden bed. It's just slow progress is still progress, little bit by bit. We all have to start somewhere. These flower beds have to start somewhere. Mine are starting from pretty much a blank slate. So there's a lot to come in the coming weeks. I cannot wait till we are past our frost date and I can start getting some more shrubs, perennials, annuals, all sorts of fun stuff in the garden to really get this place looking beautiful. So much landscaping to come. Hopefully in the next week or so, I think they're coming to pressure wash our house. So then once my husband's done painting the fence around the raised bed garden, we can start painting the house, get that done. And then hopefully it'll be like warm and it's just going to be all out getting stuff planted in the ground and doing the landscape around the property. I really appreciate you watching. Thanks for gardening with me today. Ooh. Oh my word. Wow. This wind is crazy.